Ladies and gentlemen, welcome aboard the Wright Flyer. This is your captain, Randy Wright speaking, and as always, I am here to bring you that indelible yet pure sense of enlightenment that we always bring here at Radio Aviation Excellence, the Wright Flyer. Well, folks, I think it's time that we sit down and have a conversation about exactly what's happening with respect to the Quaff News Network and Andrea Tanteros, because exactly what we're seeing is something that's a bit questionable in nature. And what it comes down to is that she has made a claim against the Quaff News Network that their ousted CEO, Roger Ailes, sexually harassed her, just like he did with respect to the alligator over there, Gretchen Carlson. And it's not something that can just be easily swept under the rug when you stop and think about it, because what they're trying to say there is that this once pillar of conservative virtue and value, and this once thought of as a conservative, just, you know, news outlet, one of the few, has betrayed its principles. Of course, that should come as no shock or surprise, because they went out on a limb to support the mafioso quafioso, irrespective of the fact that he himself was a philandering and uh, just unfaithful husband. Because if you recall, Donaldoff Julius Caesar Trumpolini has been married three times, and on each of the differing wives, he cheated on the previous one with the next one. So Malaria Trumpolini, the current Czech thumper, is the most recent of the Trump wives who had been the follow-up to a second wife. But literally what it comes down to is a greater problem that is facing the so-called conservative movement and indeed is facing the nation at large. And that problem is this, that we no longer value the traditions and honors and sacred honor that we did going back to the inception of this once thriving and flourishing representative republic and vibrant community of popular sovereigns of ours. If you go back to what it was that our founding fathers cherished the most when they came together to forge a nation in a way that had never previously been attempted before, you'll find that what they were working towards, what they wanted to achieve was to have a virtuous republic, and they considered their sacred honor to be the most valuable thing that they were placing at risk. That included their lives, their fortunes, their livelihood. But we see that this safety and sanctuary and all of that, it paled in comparison for them in an individual capacity because they were reaching for a far greater thing. It's as we have oft times reiterated on previous episodes of Radio Aviation Excellence The Right Flyer that the sum of the parts for the nation, for these United States of America, is greater than the sum of its parts. So therefore, the whole of the nation is greater than the sum of its parts. And in order to believe that, you have to go back to the mindset that our founding fathers had when they were moving forth with the conception of this nation. And that was deeply rooted in this idea of sacred honor. And no other nation on earth had ever been developed in such a way, with such foresight being the center part of its birth. And that is why the United States of America has produced the longest contiguous or uninterrupted running constitutional document in the entire course of human events. And that's not some small thing. That's not something that can just be easily brushed aside because 235 years is a very long time to have such a thing in place. It's a beautiful thing to have. It's something that clearly indicates who we are, both as a nation and as a people, and that is why the frothing at the mouth Fabian socialist leftists, along with their allies in the rank and file of the graduates of Pavlov School of Journalism for the salivating mainstream media, have gone out of their way to try and 
permanently, irreparably, fundamentally transform the United States of America away from a constitutionally endowed Federalist representative Republican form of government to some Orwellian and Marxist-based Fabian socialist dystopia. And that's why they don't want to teach the real history of the United States, because as I have reiterated on previous episodes of Radio Aviation Excellence, The Right Flyer, they realize that their twisted machinations cannot compete in the marketplace of ideas, because if anyone is allowed to think about it in an objective form or fashion, it means that they are going to lose each and every time. And the reason being is that socialism is theft by any other name. And really, folks, there is no way around that. That is just the quintessential nature of what we're facing. So why do I tie that in to Fox News and the current scandals that are going around their ousted CEO, Roger Ailes, and also with respect to Andrea, the tarantula Tanteros, she's made claims that Bill O'Reilly, their top anchorman, has made unwarranted, undesired sexual passes at her, too. And it's important to recall that this is not the first time that O'Reilly has had something like that come to the surface or forefront, either. Back uh, in 2004 or five, in, the, in that area, a little over 10 years ago, he was accused by his producer, Andrea Macris, of making undesired, uninvited, unsolicited phone calls to her house, talking about rubbing her body in certain, shall we say, strategic locations with a loofah sponge and trying to have phone sex with her. And she just didn't like it. And so she brought a suit against him. And that was quietly settled outside of court with a massive payoff, including a large uh, and desirable prime real estate condominium. But again, it shows that O'Reilly, who comes out on a regular basis and tries to claim to be a traditionalist, one who's standing up for America's time-honored values, traditions, and institutions, is really a hypocrite. And the reason he's a hypocrite is because he's out there saying, do as I say, but not as I do. I will live life wholly differently than what I go out onto the air and preach all the time. And is it any wonder, then, that a large grouping of American citizens are disenfranchised and alienated with the media. It's because even the so-called conservative punditry and commentarate has engaged in questionable conduct. And if the Republican Party is the party that has promoted these family values, these true aspects of what makes a nation work or going down the lines of what our founding fathers desired for us to be, that of a virtuous republic, then how is it that we are lining up behind the nominee for the gutless opposition party or GOP, that of Donaldoff Julius Caesar Trumpolini? It really should be sending up red flags and sounding off alarm bells for decent, hardworking, red-blooded American citizens from coast to coast and border to border. Because this man is not what he claims to be or who he claims to be, he has espoused all sorts of unsavory characteristics throughout his life. In fact, if you recall, he went on to the Howard Stern radio program years and years ago to brag about his marital infidelity and even having conquests with sexual trysts with women who were married to other men. And he, he essentially called his trying to avoid sexually transmitted diseases or venereal diseases as his own personal Vietnam in which he was a brave soldier. Now keep in mind, this is a man who received five deferments from being drafted to go fight in the Vietnam War, claiming that he had bone spurs in his feet. But what's so amazing about that is they miraculously healed seemingly overnight once he was granted the deferments. And he was an athletic kid. He was a, a kid that had gone to a military academy or prep school uh, as part to deal with his juvenile delinquency because apparently he was too much of a handful for his parents. And that 
was okay enough for him to go out and march and drill and do all of the exercise that was required of a military style education and training for his academy. But ultimately what it shows is that he too is a liar, a huckster, a con artist, a snake oil salesman. And of course, we here at Radio Aviation Excellence, the Right Flyer, have been covering that for nearly a year, folks. As we are approaching September, we are actually approaching our one-year anniversary here at Radio Aviation Excellence, the Right Flyer, because our premiere episode aired on September 11th of 2015. And that date was not just coincidental. We chose that date on purpose to reflect what we value here, both as a nation and as a people, because it was that during that time that we came together in solidarity and unity as we had always done before that. And it was tragic that it took such an atrocity to truly bring us together. But now we see that the forces of division are working against us, that they are pitting American citizen against American citizen, much by the design of the graduates of Pavlov School of Journalism for the salivating mainstream media and the historical revisionists who have infiltrated our institutions of education from coast to coast and border to border. And that has left us in this untenable, unsustainable situation. The scenario is one that simply cannot be ignored but that is what the Quaff News Network would have you do. But we see that the Fox News Network sexual scandals just keep getting worse and worse. Andrea Tanteros, who had been the host of The Five and also one of the hosts of their rather feminist daytime program known as Outnumbered, had been sacked earlier in the year. Now, she was claiming even back then that it had to do with the fact of her gender, delving into identity politics, and it may have, seeing as these allegations of sexual misconduct are there. And they don't seem to be something that you can just easily sweep under the rug. They don't seem to be going away. And we already see that Gretchen Carlson, the alligator, the one who thinks that it's okay to implement a so-called assault weapons ban and still be in line with the Second Amendment was one of the ones out there, too, trying to say that she was sexually harassed and she resigned over it and is currently suing Roger Ailes and 21st Century Fox, the parent company of the Quaff News Network. I mean, folks, you really can't make this stuff up, but it goes to a deeper heart of the matter. The Fox News channel had attempted to claim that it was fair and balanced, but we saw all throughout this disastrous 2016 presidential elections primary process that they were not. First, of course, they tried to back the pro-amnesty candidate there in narco rube eieio as if he was somehow a good paragon of conservative values, but he was not resonating with the American people. They throughout the entire process, though, continued to attack Texas Senator Ted Cruz, the only true dyed-in-the-wool constitutional compositionist who was in the race. Once they lost Rubio, they turned their attention to the mafioso quafioso. Now, remember, he had started a kind of scandalous sort of uh, back and forth with the Quaff News Network over Megyn Kelly, because back during the first presidential candidate debate for the gutless opposition party, the Megyn Kelly had asked him a question that he is certainly going to encounter during this general election cycle being pitted against Hillary Rotten Clinton that he didn't like. And therefore he threw a fit. And he said that if she was going to be on the next scheduled Quaff News presidential candidate debate, then he was going to go out and run a counter program on some other news network in which he would be fundraising for the troops. But that, too, turned into a fiasco. It turned into a perfect excrement storm in that he he claimed, went out and made all of these verbose claims in front of the cameras for the graduates of Pavlov School of Journalism for the salivating mainstream media that he had raised all this money for the troops. But the veterans groups were saying they hadn't received any of it. 
The groups and charities that he chose said they had not received one thin dime, or then only half of the promised numbers. And of course, when the Washington Post and various other information media sources and outlets began to apply pressure to the mafioso quafioso, he threw a fit. But it shows he's miserly. And he's always been miserly. But going back to the Quaff News Network and this strain of infidelity and alleged sexism that ties in to the twin cancerous doctrines of political correctness and moral relativism, we see that there is a greater decay and degradation in the system. And it shows that there were a bunch of frauds and charlatans engaging in chicanery, attempting to convince us that they were these paragons of conservative values, that they were a more right-leaning news source as compared to the other outlets dominated by the rank and file of the graduates of Pavlov School of Journalism for the salivating mainstream media. But again, it's all proving to be bumpkiss. Partly, that's due to the fact that Rupert Murdoch, who owns News Corp, that owns Fox News Network, has always been a rabid, frothing-at-the-mouth Fabian socialist leftist. He has held fundraising things for Hillary Clinton dating back to her time as being the senator for the state of New York. And so that is coming front and center. Now that Roger Ailes, who was the one-time conservative leader of the network is gone we're watching the leftward spiral of the quaff news network just basically accelerate exponentially but let's look at, at what's going on with ales there's been a lot of rumor and it's been somewhat corroborated that he is now working in some official capacity with the trump candidacy and campaign and that he is advising him now, this seems strange because, as you recall, we've also mentioned that Stephen K. Bannon, the former head of Trump Bart, I mean Breitbart News, has also been brought into the Trump train as the chief executive officer or CEO of the campaign. Now, I find that a bit bizarre because what in the hell is a CEO of a campaign? It's as though Trump is running this as a business. And again, that's to try and claim that he has all of this bigly, greatly business acumen when in fact nothing could be further from the truth. Most of the companies he started has been, or have been rather, run into the ground. They don't represent good business decisions. They don't represent what sound business policy would suggest. And again, it's as my first officer, Jeremy Grapenton, and I have reiterated on previous episodes of Radio Aviation Excellence, The Right Flyer, that the United States of America is not a business. It cannot be run as a business because our fundamental and inalienable rights, which were endowed to us by our creator, who is none other than the God of nature himself, cannot be negotiated. And you see, that was one of the major strains and complaints that we had against Donald Trump is that he was claiming throughout this all that everything is negotiable, that everything can be placed on the bargaining table. And if you go back to June, you can recall that rocket surgeon Dr. Ben I'm a Victim Carson had gone in front of the cameras of MSNBC and said that we ought to place our Second Amendment right to keep and bear firearms on the negotiating table, that he didn't see a need for it. Again, folks, this points to a common denominator as to the vast plethora of problems that currently face this once thriving and flourishing representative republic and vibrant community of popular sovereigns of ours. And that is this, that when we distance and divorce ourselves from the fundamental tenets contained in the four corners of our shared United States Constitution, we continue to see the decay happen within our country. And of course, the reason for that is that the Constitution is based on those natural law tenets, which are by their own nature timeless. So that means they're just as applicable today as they were at the inception of this nation 235 years ago, as God willing, they will be 235 years from today. But we know that the Fox News Network had gone out there for decades now and had claimed to be fair and balanced, but they weren't. The 
the amount of coverage that they gave to Don Trumpolini for free and all of the graduates of Pavlov School of Journalism for the salivating mainstream media are guilty of this was three times as much as any candidate. Why? Because it was a gaffe machine that was bringing them ratings. But again, is ratings and entertainment really all that matters now? No, because as we have said before, the only litmus test that matters, that should ever matter, when determining whether or not a candidate vying for the highest office in the land is qualified to wield the reins of political power in this republic of ours is the constitution itself. We can't get away from that. That is the true inherent nature of who we are, both as a nation and as a people. But of course, we know that there has been this concerted effort, this ceaseless, relentless effort to do this over and over again. And they don't want to back down because they see a light at the end of the tunnel, which they think will free them and will allow them to move forward with their dark and twisted machinations to fundamentally transform the United States of America away from being a constitutionally endowed federalist representative republic in which we the people are the true ultimate wielders of sovereignty to some just god-awful Orwellian, dark and twisted, Fabian socialist dystopia. No, that is not who we are. That is never who we have been. And God willing, it is never who we will become. So it brings us to this election cycle of 2016, which the graduates of Pavlov School of Journalism for the salivating mainstream media had referred to as the election cycle in which we just discard with conventional wisdom being the election of betrayal. Now, I know I've said that before, and I know that Jeremy and I have harped on it before, but it does bear repeating. Look at the way that you have Laura Inkampf over there at Life Zets and her radio program promoting this writer known as Edmund Kozak. Now, Edmund Kozak had put out an article in which he said that those of us who adhere to the Constitution are fools, that we are believing that the Constitution is perfect. Well, no, if you go back to the opening lines of the preamble to the United States Constitution, it says, we the people do ordain and establish this Constitution in order to create a more perfect, meaning that it could not reach perfection, meaning that inherently the document understood that humanity is imperfect and it makes room for the imperfections of humanity. And that matters, because if you think about it, it is why our Constitution is the longest contiguous running Constitution in the entire course of human events. And why is it that people like Kozak don't believe in the Constitution? Why is it that they act as though the Constitution is some quaint and antiquated thing? Well, it's because deep down in their heart of hearts, what they want to accomplish is a similar redefinition of the United States of America. They don't want it to be based on the natural law tenets. They want it to be almost a tribalism. And that is the danger that we've seen just crop up with respect to the Lion Branch Trump videos. And that's because a huge swath of their support comes from the so-called alternative right or alt-right. Now, the alt-right, in many instances, wants to make the United States of America be defined around either racial or tribal identities, which goes against the natural law tenets that were first pinned down in what would become the United States by the the poetic hand of Thomas Jefferson in the Declaration of Independence. One of the truths that he held to be self-evident is that all men are created equal, meaning humanity is created equally. But of course, as we have warned, going back to our premiere episode, which aired almost a year ago now, folks, um, this dark and twisted game of semantics has basically changed equality. The frothing at the mouth Fabian socialist leftists want it to be equal outcomes as opposed to equal opportunity. And it's that sort of dark and twisted machination that creates the 
divisions of identity politics and balkanization that have just started haunting this once thriving and flourishing representative republic and vibrant community of popular sovereigns of ours. And that is troubling. The reason that is so troubling is it goes against the whole notion of equal protection under the law. And Donald Trump has struggled with that. He struggled from distancing himself from these more seedy and nefarious elements. And again, it shows that there is this type of corruption of morality that runs deep, that it is a truly ugly and disgusting thing that we are struggling with in the United States. And, of course, it's all rooted in being distanced from the Constitution. Again, unlike what Kozak said, it's not that we see the Constitution as perfect, but it is the closest thing to perfection that any nation on the face of God's green earth has managed to develop, particularly in modernity. And so it explains why, in our relatively brief yet illustrious history, we have been buoyed to such heights. It is because we recognize these natural law tenets that are inscribed on the hearts and souls of each and every one of us in our capacity as citizens of these United States of America, whether we be natural born or naturalized. But Trump is one of those people that goes out and custom tailors his message for whatever particular audience that he happens to be speaking in front of on that given day to try and garner votes or to spread division and divisiveness. Because literally, if you look at the way he's been running his campaign, the fact that he dismantled all of his logistics in and his ground game and all of those various caucus and primary states that he won throughout the primary process, that doesn't make any sense, particularly when you consider that what he's going up against is the well-oiled political machine of the Clinton cartel. Hillary Clinton has not dismantled a damn thing. She's made it to where she can just sit back because Donald Trump keeps sticking his foot in his mouth and continues to drive a wedge into the gate or into the base of the gutless opposition party or GOP. Now that is not something that will be easily overcome. And I believe that this was done intentionally, done to ensure that Hillary Rotten Clinton, who has been his friend for generations now, or decades at least, um, would have a shoe in to the White House, that she could just waltz in and essentially take the reins of political power as though she were somehow entitled to them. Now, that is a, a scheme, a plot and a scheme that, almost sounds conspiratorial in its nature, but when you look at the great weight of the evidence, it becomes exceedingly difficult to deny that that seems to be the way things are going with respect to this 2016 presidential election cycle. And the fact that we have so many so-called conservative pundits and commentators or commentators who have gone out and just embraced the mafioso quafioso it makes you wonder, did they ever truly adhere to the conservative principles and values and our traditions and institutions that they preached about for decade upon successive decade, or was it all just a money-making scheme for them? Well, when you look at Laura Inkoff and the way that her alt-right writers at LifeZets continues to declare war on the Constitution, it you know, it basically takes away any doubt. It takes away the ability of us to claim that there was no way that that could be the case. Because deep down, what it has done is it's shown that she just paid lip service to it. And now she senses that there's a bigger audience, one that cuts younger, that will be a natural outlet for what she is wanting to do. And, you know, that's one of the things they always do in advertising, is that they always attempt to go for the younger generation. They believe that the younger generation is the one that's going to be doing all of this spending. But if you look at the way that the young up and coming generation has been hurtled and, 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 and just pummeled with these outrageous education expenses and whatnot, it doesn't make any sense. Where are they getting their money? They're not saving. They're not doing anything, they're just trying to survive, but they've also never truly been taught their 
national character, heritage, spirit, and above all, identity as American citizens. They don't have a good foundation in the constitutional uprising and birth of these United States of America. Now, some of them do, if they're like me, and they went out and they did it on their own to challenge their professors who went out and said ludicrous and ridiculous things, but that's not the vast majority of them. And we see that the way that the historical revisionists have just gone in from into all of our institutions of education from primary level all the way through postgraduate studies and have started tearing apart the traditional history of the United States of America, you begin to see this dangerous and untenable and unsustainable situation that we find ourselves in as I sit here and speak into this microphone. And it's something that shows no signs of getting better at any time within the foreseeable future. But we, in our capacity, as the true ultimate wielders of popular sovereignty, are going to have to overcome this. But that does not mean turning to some messianic figure who claims that he or she alone has the ability to save this country. Because if you stop and think about it, in an objective fashion, our founding fathers inherently distrusted such people. And it makes sense. During the American War of Independence, they were going up against the centralized might and authority of the crown of Great Britain. They were standing up against these attempts to destroy the individual value and dignity of the citizens, and they were pushing for an Enlightenment ideal. That Enlightenment ideal was that we, the people, are the true wielders of sovereignty. And therefore, the government must trace its rightful and legitimate authority back to delegated powers that we, the people in our capacity as the true ultimate wielders of popular sovereignty, had essentially delegated to them. And what that means is if the Constitution, which is a wonderful social contract, is breached by the government, then we, the people, have a right to petition that government for redress of grievances, and then if the government fails to look into that petition of grievances and just continues to double down on the malarkey and the chicanery that has become the new norm in the arena of American politics, then we have to take more drastic measures. And you find that in the writings of the Founding Fathers. Uh, Thomas Jefferson talked about it being watering the tree of liberty with the blood of tyrants and patriots alike. But before any of those people who have been running around trying to skew what true constitutional compositionists like yours truly or my first officer Jeremy Graventon or our first air marshal Mr. Nelson Ward have said, it's not that we are proactively out there advocating for a violent armed insurrection or overthrow of the federal government. No. But. If you go back to the roots of the nation, you will see that that is certainly an option and one that cannot be just wholly discarded. Except that what we are facing right now is a type of complacency that was previously or hitherto unknown. And that complacency has been born out of this entitlement mentality that has been spread from the Cloward and Piven type mindset. Now, recall, that Cloward and Piven were two academician eggheads that came out of Columbia University, and they had developed a scheme in which they hoped to overwhelm the welfare system that had already been created by the frothing-at-the-mouth Fabian Socialist FDR in the New Deal, to then have the people come crawling to the government on their knees to sacrifice and surrender their fundamental and inalienable God-given rights for a fleeting sense of security, to have it seem as though all was being made better. And of course, their answer was always with the federal government. They thought the federal government knew best and that the central government would be the best avenue of achieving their goals, which was to promote these ideas, which was to essentially go forth and try and redefine the United States. And that's what their goal has been for 
at least a half century now because Cloward and Piven came out of the 50s and 60s. And they were up against people like Zygmunt Dobbs, who was doing his utmost to try and purge our institutions of education of these frothing at the mouth Fabian socialist leftists. He warned that they used the puffery, that they used all of this sort of vague and abstract terminology in order to attempt to bamboozle the people. Make them feel that things were safe and therefore lull them into a false sense of security. And remember that what they were wanting the people to do was to sacrifice their fundamental and inalienable rights, which were endowed to them by their creator, the God of nature, for a false sense of security. And that brings us back to one of the adages from Benjamin Franklin who said that those who surrender essential liberties for a fleeting sense of security deserve neither liberty nor security and shall surely have neither. Well, is that not where we find ourselves today? Is that not what the frothing at the mouth baby and socialist leftists argue at every available opportunity? Do they not say that we ought to abridge our fundamental and inalienable God-given right to keep and bear firearms to defend our home and our families and the security and sanctity of mind to, 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 to create this fleeting sense of security, which is erroneous? Because as we have shown time and time again, it's actually these so-called gun-free zones that make these atrocities worse. You see, that's what it is. It's always based on raw emotionalism. And that's why we have warned of the dangers of raw emotionalism, because it leaves you susceptible to manipulation by those nefarious elements who are out there looking to manipulate you. Look at the way that Donald Trump has manipulated huge swaths of the American electorate by telling them that he was out there and he was going to build a wall. He's got smally hands, but the wall will be bigly and perfect like his hair. Except that now... He's backing down from it. He's saying we need to be humane. We need to be nice. In other words, he doesn't want to hold certain people accountable for their words, deeds, and actions. And when you look at his lifestyle, that makes sense. Because he's never once been held accountable truly for his marital infidelities. He has never once been held accountable for the way that he has just trampled upon people, the way that his business tactics and strategies have just gone out and and just pummeled people's rights and their businesses and destroyed them. He is all about stepping on people. And certainly when it comes to rights, look at the way that he went after that little old lady with his abuse of eminent domain. He's going to double down on the Kelo decision, which truly does violate the clear and concise language in the Fifth Amendment's prohibition on unlawful takings or imminent domain. Now, you see, imminent domain by its design was designed for a public purpose, a public use. But what Trump was doing was he wanted to erect a limousine park where this lady's house was. Now, ultimately, that casino went bankrupt because Trump is not as greatly of a businessman as the Lion Branch Trump Vidians would have us believe. But he lost that case. He ultimately lost that case. And that, that old lady was able to keep her home until she got to a point where she was unable to live on her own and had to have assisted living. And then the house was sold and ultimately demolished. But the, the plan that they had for the limousine park never occurred because in the interim, that casino went under. It went bust. It went belly up because of mismanagement. And so we're going to be looking at the mafioso coafioso as someone who's going to be able to run this country, someone that is going to be able to, to fix the problems that face us both as a nation and as a people. You see, that again is the inherent risk and danger that we face when dealing with a, a person that claims to be a messianic figure. It's why we say, do not turn to a messianic figure, go back to basics. And of course... In these United States of America, basics is the clear and concise language contained within the four corners of our shared United States Constitution. We are 
defined both as a nation and as a people in that beautiful text, in that greatest social contract or compact ever devised by the hands of men, yet divinely inspired by providence above. And it is through the designs of that magnificent document that we gain our proper working and knowledge and understanding of who we are, what the proper scope and application of government is, and how to overcome the hurdles, obstacles, and adversities that have been placed in our path. Because for far too long now, the frothing of the mouth Fabian socialist leftists have been doing everything in their power to pit American citizen against American citizen in the hopes and designs of trying to force us into being something that we were never originally intended to be, into sacrificing our fundamental and inalienable God-given rights for these false and fleeting senses of security, and for believing that the central government is the best equipped to deal with the problems that crop up in the facets of our daily lives. But of course, nothing could be further from the truth. That's why the state governments, when you look at the tenets of federalism, are endowed with what's known as plenary or near absolute authority. But again, by ratifying the Bill of Rights, the states agreed to acquiesce and abide by them. Now, of course, the Supreme Court has attempted to go out and whittle that away, and that's why you saw the post-Civil War amendments come up, particularly Section 5 of the 14th Amendment that is called incorporation to the states, meaning that they are forcing the Bill of Rights, once they've been adjudicated, to apply to the states. Now, that was a bit redundant, but it was because you had various levels of government in the era of Reconstruction and then in the era of Jim Crow and at various times through the 20th century ignoring the aspects of the Bill of Rights, ignoring the first 10 amendments to our shared United States Constitution, and thereby violating the supreme law of the land. Because if we all recall that Article 6, Clause 2, what is known in the common vernacular as the Supremacy Clause, clearly states that the Constitution itself composes the supreme law of the land. And that is one of those realities that the graduates of Pavlov School of Journalism for the Salivating Mainstream Media, the frothing at the mouth, Fabian socialist leftists, the alt-right, all of these nefarious groups ignore. Again, because it goes against their twisted propagandistic narrative and agenda. Now, as I have said before on a previous solo flight special edition of Radio Aviation Excellence, the Right Flyer, the whole notion of a false perception in the arena of American politics can be more impactful, more damaging, more accepted than reality. And of course, that goes against the way that one would naturally or normally think with respect to these issues, because when you think of what Aristotle said in his Art of Rhetoric, he said that people more easily believe the truth, that you can't just easily deceive people. But that's the thing. That's what we must recall about the Fabian socialists and now the alt-right that is attempting to use their tactics in the same manner, embracing just the opposite pole of the tactics and strategies of divide and conquer and identity politics and balkanization. We see that they have worked so meticulously, intentionally, and tirelessly towards creating a rock-solid lie. So yes, while it is easier for people to believe the truth, if the people have been deceived or pushed to the point of being brainwashed, then no, it's very difficult for them to accept the truth because they don't know what the truth is. And that brings us once again to the twin cancerous doctrines of political correctness and moral relativism. Political correctness is used as the sword where moral relativism is used as the shield. The sword of political correctness is used to infringe upon the fundamental and inalienable God-given rights of the true ultimate wielders of popular sovereignty in this once thriving and flourishing representative republic of ours, we the people, so that they can't have freedom of expression. 
You see, that's why they try and outlaw certain types of thought. It's why they try and outlaw certain types of speech. It's why they want to go out and rewrite us. And then they argue their position as being the people of tolerance. So they go out and they do all of this intolerant nastiness. And they go around trying to dismantle the most open, free, and honest government and system ever devised by the hands of men, yet divinely inspired by providence above, to, to claim that, look, all morality is relative. That you, you see it with the way that they point out to the the actions of the Islamo-fascists and try and say, well, the Christians were just as bad too. Yuck, yuck, yuck. Maybe they were some thousand years ago, but even then, not really. That's the thing. Islam was still acting the same way a thousand plus years ago as they are now. So that hasn't changed. But it goes to show that what the moral relativists are trying to do is once again weaken the individual fibers that make up the societal framework and, and fabric of these United States of America. And so what it ultimately comes down to is they are seeking to fundamentally, irreparably, and permanently redefine the United States of America, transforming us away from being a constitutionally endowed federalist representative republic into this twisted Fabian socialist agenda and nightmare and dystopia. And so when Fox News begins to lose all of its credibility, and then when you have people like Sean Wannity and Michael Weiner Savage and Laura Inkomp and Lush Bimbo just betraying their principles and hopping onto the bandwagon of populism, which was something that our founding fathers inherently distrusted, that's why we are not a direct democracy. That is why we are a representative republic you see that all of a sudden our most powerful voices are gone. They have sold us out. They have drenched themselves in the blood of patriots and danced on the graves of our forefathers and our predecessors whose blood, sweat, tears, and toil built this magnificent nation of ours. And they've done so for 30 pieces of silver. The Judas Iscariots among us cannot be ignored, and they must be held accountable for their words, deeds, and actions. This election cycle of betrayal will go down in the annals of history as a horrific example of what betrayal can do to a once proud, thriving, and flourishing nation. And you see, Donald Trump is not trying to win. He's not trying to unify the base of the gutless opposition party or GOP. He's going out there and recall that he said that it is the Republican Party, not the conservative party. He based that on an erroneous notion that there are apparently, at least according to him, all of these national-based conservative parties. Again, showing New York values. Once again, Texas Senator Ted Cruz has been vindicated for words that Trump had said on his own, back in a 1909 interview with Tim Russert on Meet the Press, when he said that his values would be different than those of Iowans, when he said that he was almost certainly pro-choice in every sense of the word, and that he didn't like guns, et cetera, et cetera, well, he, he was saying that that was because of being from New York, New York values. But no, he's the one that then on the debate stage early on during the primary process tried to dabble in this political correctness, using it once again as a sword in the same fashion that the frothing at the mouth Fabian socialist leftists do in an attempt to try and say that that was Cruz attacking 9-11. That's literally what he did, folks. That's literally the point of view that he put forth. That is truly what he argued in front of Quaff News' cameras. But now, Quaff News is just running down the sidelines, being chased by a proverbial hornet's nest, 
stirred up by these allegations of sexual harassment and misconduct. Now, both Gretchy the Alligator Carlson and Andrea the Tarantula um, Torontos, or whatever her name is, T Tantatos, or whatever, um, they are Trump dumpsters. They were rabidly out. Andrea Tantera went out and was just saying anyone who disagrees with Trump is a moron. And she did that before the primary process was over. And so one of the chief complaints of the Lion Branch Trump Vidians who are congregating together in the Trump tabernacle was that they were sick and tired of the graduates of Pavlov School of Journalism for the salivating mainstream media in election cycle after election cycle successively choosing the candidate for the gutless opposition party or GOP. But here we are. The truth of the matter is the salivating mainstream media has selected the GOP nominee. They did it by giving him three times as much airtime as any of his opponents. They did it by not vetting him until after it was too late. They did it by ensuring that he secured it. And now, now they've turned on him. Now he's collapsing. And we said this would happen. But the Lion Branch Trump Vidians who suffer from acute ostrich syndrome, thereby shoving their heads up their posterior as opposed to in the sand, have brought this upon themselves. They are now just staring in bewilderment as Trump abandons position after position of which they claimed was of the utmost importance to them and continues to slide further and further back into his traditional stances and positions of that of a frothing at the mouth Fabian socialist leftist and a progressive and they're stunned. Now, they'll still go out there because far too much of their pride is involved. Their egos are far too wrapped up in it because they've been projecting their own hopes, dreams, aspirations, and identity onto the mafioso quafioso. They, they can't back away from him. And I believe that the most high profile of these radical shifts occurred with little orphan Annie Yap Yap Toto Coulter the floozy because she went out there and wrote that just childish sounding book in 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 Trump we trust e pluribus awesome she said that of the two things that he could abandon that would cause his people to turn on him would be immigration and abortion now, what has he been waffling on since before he threw his hat in the ring? Well, that was always abortion. He was always a strong pro-choice type, but also immigration reform. Because back in 2012, during that presidential election cycle, when Mittens Romnikin, another just detente member of the gutless opposition party, or GOP, went out and said that, if we just enforce the laws, the illegal aliens will self-deport. He says, that's too mean-spirited. That's too cold-hearted. That's too, too ferocious. It's too bigly for my smally hands and my bigly beautiful brain. Give me an ever-loving break. Because what it shows is that he's going back to that language. You see, we're going to deport, but it's going to be humane. It, it goes back to that laughable rubbish of so-called compassionate conservatism. Basically, it presupposes or puts up this argument that by enforcing the laws, we're being inhumane, or that somehow by being conservative, we're being inhumane. When in fact, nothing could be further from the truth. What is inhumane is allowing these people to continue to have hope that they can come over here illegally, drain us dry like parasites, and then run back to their nations, being uh, foisted onto the coyotes that are just out there trying to make a buck, and then also exposing them to these nefarious drug cartels that have seemingly taken over the entire uh, governmental edifice of Mexico. That is inhumane. It's inhumane to 
ignore our laws, to selectively enforce our laws. It's inhumane to tax people to care for those who came here breaking the law. And of course, what's intellectually disingenuous about all of these people that are pushing for amnesty and open borders and all of this crap, and they say it's mean, it's so mean and degrading, except that let's look at which nation on the face of God's green earth has the most liberal immigration laws of any meaning that we accept more than any other nation on earth. Why, it's the United States. Compare that to how Mexico reacts to those that cross in illegally from Guatemala and Honduras and the various other Latin American countries, and you see that they're either shot on sight or it's an automatic two-year felony. Think of the way that they treated that Marine that got lost, to, uh, what was it, a year or two back in California who had firearms in his truck, and they put him through all of that ordeal. And it took a, a, a gigantic effort to get him released. Because, once again, Barack Hussein Obama didn't want to act on that. Barack Hussein Obama didn't want to stand up for the American citizen or the true ultimate wielders of popular sovereignty, because, again, Barack Hussein Obama cannot divorce himself from his frothing-at-the-mouth Fabian socialist agenda, which is diametrically opposed to all that we hold near and dear in this once thriving and flourishing representative republic and vibrant community of popular sovereigns of ours. You see, that's the deleterious, dangerous position that we find ourselves in. And so, while our Constitution is still in place, it's battered and bruised, and instead of turning to a constitutional compositionist, one who goes by the original composition of the clear and concise language contained within the four corners of that great social contract or compact, we turn to a charlatan, a carnival barker, who has no knowledge of the Constitution, who has never really once read it through, or else he would know that there are not 12 articles in the seven-article document, and no, that laughable bovine excrement apologist argument that, well, he meant the Tenth Amendment, that would be Article 12. No, the Bill of Rights is a separate part of the Constitution. Article 5 clearly states it, and therefore, it is separate. And then also, the preamble to the Bill of Rights states it. But then again, so many Americans don't know of the preamble to the Bill of Rights. They only know of the preamble to the Constitution itself. And again, this is because they have not really been teaching the proper scope, context, and application of the Constitution in our institutions of education from coast to coast and border to border. Why? Because, again, their desire is to fundamentally and irreparably transform these United States of America away from being that of a constitutionally endowed representative Republican form of government to that dark and twisted Fabian socialist dystopia that truly has no place in an open, honest, and above all free society like that of the United States of America. And it's not easy to admit this. It's not easy to to see that that is one of those major problems that is facing us. Because nobody likes to see their nation, their hopes, their dreams and aspirations be exposed to this sort of chicanery. Because it means that our diligent efforts that we've made to have inroads, to take back our culture and our society from these Marxist-based, frothing-at-the-mouth Fabian socialist leftists are being undermined, and more so than anything, by those who claim to be members of our own party. Then, to add insult to injury, the pouring of the salt into the wound comes from people like Hush Bimbo, or Lush Bimbo, who essentially came out and said that he knew all along that Trump wasn't serious about immigration, then, Lush, why were you not covering that in your commentary? I thought, sure, 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 you have that claim that you're doing it to, to you know, refusing to endorse candidates to be as objective as possible, and that your show has always been about objectivity. 
But if that were the case, then you would have vetted this. If you knew that all along, why didn't you mention your suspicions? Again, it's because you're going out of your way to stand up for and defend the mafioso quafioso because you've been good golfing buddies with them. Folks, if you go back to the beginning of the primary process, you can recall that Hush Bimbo even admitted on one of those programs at that time that maybe he wasn't the best to be analyzing this because he knew so many of those involved, but of them all. The one he knew the best, because if you remember, he's always been a big golfer type. He's always loved golfing, is Trump. Now, Trump is known for all of these golf resorts that he owns worldwide. In fact, when the whole Brexit thing was going down, Trump was over there in Scotland making a fool of himself, saying that they supported Brexit when they didn't, um, to not, not for any foreign policy knowledge, but to check up on a uh, golf resort that he was building in Scotland. Or not even building, but purchasing or acquiring for himself. But again, it goes to the heart of the matter. And the heart of the matter is this election cycle is all about betrayal. It's about corruption and chicanery and engaging in these tactics and strategies that would be truly befitting for the P.T. Barnum of our era. Now, I know that I've called Trump the P.T. Barnum of our era before. But you see, it really has come full circle now. It has really gone the route that we feared it would. We knew it would go this way, folks. And I have a feeling that the vast majority of you, our cherished listening passengers and audience members, realized that it would go that way too. Why else would the Never Trump movement be as strong as it has been? But the problem is we see that there is still going to be a push for a tyranny of false unity by those who literally believe that somehow Donaldoff Julius Caesar Trumpolini is better than Hillary Clinton. Now, how is it that the top donor for Hillary Rotten Clinton, this donor who's gone out and supported as many frothing at the mouth offenders of Fabian socialism as possible, could be better than her? Oh, because he says it? Except that he's already flip-flopped on everything. Trump flip-flops so much that he makes John F. N. Kerry look as though he is some stalwart of values and core principles. And remember, one of the things that sunk that sank Kerry back during the 2004 presidential election was that he said that he voted for the war in Iraq before he voted against it, trying to get on both sides of that issue. Now, that is an exercise of intellectual disingenuousness in its worst form. But on top of that, it's also a form of political kabuki theater. And it is the worst example of it that we have seen. And until the bizarre ascendancy of the New York billionaire, businessman, real estate tycoon, and all-around Bulgarian, Donaldoff, Julius Caesar, Trumpolini, or is that John Barron or John Miller? I just don't happen to know which one he's using today. But truth be told, falls upon us to be knowledgeable about those who are vying for the reins of political power in this once thriving and flourishing representative republic and vibrant community of popular sovereigns of ours. And that's the problem. We have not been doing that. We have allowed ourselves to think that some entertainer was going to somehow greatly improve our lot in life, would magically though never expanding upon the things that he claimed, bring this nation back to the path to prosperity. And then he goes out and he says that we'll make America great again. But how do you make America great again if you don't know what made us great in the first place and when you accept the fact that the United States of America never once ceased being great? You see, that is the great lie that has been foisted upon us by Don Trumpolini and the Lion Branch Trumpvidian Tabernacle. They are not being truthful. They have never once been truthful, and that puts us in this current untenable, unsustainable, and unacceptable situation 
that we find ourselves in currently as I sit here and speak into this microphone, conveying this message unto you. So we see that that problem is there. It's glaring, it's open, it's obvious, and it shows no signs of improving at any time within the foreseeable future. So we have to walk back and see where things went awry. Well, things first started going awry decades ago. Recall that with the defeat of Herbert Hoover in 1929 and the ascension, or rather in 1930, and the ascension of Franklin Delano Roosevelt, conservatism essentially died for a long time. We, we, we still haven't had a true constitutional compositionist like that of Calvin Coolidge. And it wasn't until 1964 that Barry Goldwater assumed the reins of a conservative. But deep down, when you look at his positions, particularly later in his political career, you'll find that Barry Goldwater was not that conservative that he did not adhere to conservative principles and values. And so that led the nation astray again. And, of course, you had that Daisy ad where that little girl was wiped out in a nuclear bomb blast because Barry Goldwater, he'd tick off the Soviets. He'd disrupt detente. He would essentially foist this nation into an untenable situation. Except that, not really. We, we know that LBJ was the one that foisted up the Gulf of Tonkin incident, creating an incident that wasn't there. Once again, having the support, at least at that time, of the graduates of Pavlov School of Journalism for the salivating mainstream media. And they were trying to have it done in such a way as to make the public convinced that, oh, look, it was good at that time. But then when they turned their back on it, when they started to become anti-war, they blamed it on the Republicans. Why? Because it was Richard Milhouse Nixon who was getting us out of Vietnam. But no, they were opportunists back then. They were frothing at the mouth Fabian socialists back then, and they saw that as their opportunity to essentially take over the Democrat Party. And as you can see, there are no conservative Democrats anymore. They, there's no room for them in the party. They go out of their way to ostracize them and to outcast them and to ensure that they're not part of the party. And now we see that they're also trying to do that with conservatives within the rank and file of the gunless opposition party or GOP. That is the untenable situation that we find ourselves in today. And it all ties in to this sort of decay that we've been seeing, the type of decay that is now miring the Quaff News Network in scandal. You know, it, it just, it, it's all basically a linchpin to the support of Donaldoff, Julius Caesar, Trampolini. And that is... It's just something that cannot be ignored. We can't ignore it because it goes to the heart of the matter. And the heart of the matter is when you don't have a solid foundation and understanding in who you are and what defines you and what makes your nation and your laws and your system of polity and government and your court systems work, then you are a lost soul. And that's where we are. That is exactly the design of the frothing at the mouth Fabian socialist leftists. They are the ones that wanted to foist us into that untenable and unacceptable situation. That situation, if left unfettered and if not addressed, if we fail to address it, is only going to fester, creating a much greater problem than what we already have now. Therefore, all of the problems that are festering in this once thriving and flourishing representative republic of ours are going to get worse. But for what? For what purpose? Why are we turning to a messianic figure? Well, again, it's because of moral relativism and political correctness. And so those twin cancerous doctrines are what also cloud 
people's judgment and push us down this untenable, this unacceptable, this unsustainable path. And we just can't do it. We can ill afford to do it because you have to recall that the United States of America, as I sit here and speak into this microphone currently, is facing not only an identity crisis, but a slew of constitutional crises brought about by the narcissist-in-chief Barack Hussein Obama. But it wasn't just brought about by him. We have been going down this steady leftward slide for generations. And because we allowed ourselves to be lulled into a false sense of security, that somehow everything that we hold near and dear being the truth would come to the forefront and would clearly be accepted by the vast majority of the population or what had been known in the Nixon era and through the Reagan era as the so-called silent majority would just go along with it. But we didn't realize just the influence that the frothing at the mouth Fabian socialist leftists had gotten within popular culture. And we didn't realize just how far they had infiltrated our various institutions of education from coast to coast and border to border. And so when we have that, we just can't, we can't get around it. We can't fix that problem unless we begin to develop a long, drawn-out, sustainable plan that is practicable and real-world to combat these problems. That's what it's going to take. We are going to have to be as meticulous and as patient and as stalwart as the frothing at the mouth Fabian socialist leftists because these United States of America did not reach this position overnight. This has been in the works for a century and a half now and those frothing at the mouth Fabian socialist leftists see a light at the end of the tunnel and they think that their victory is within grasp. And it is if we allow them. To have it. It is if we back down and bow down and capitulate to these twisted, diabolical plots and schemes. And you see, ultimately, I think a lot of this surfaced when it did because, again, they're attempting to strip conservatives of their voice. Remember that Ailes, before he decided to join the hair side, had been a conservative. He had helped produce Rush Limbaugh's television program. He had helped create conservative media, but then he sold out on it. What was it? Just a cash cow? Well, again, that's what it seems to come down to each and every time. When you start and look at it in a logical and ob objective fashion, that common thread, that common strain is there. It is the common denominator of what is ailing us and plaguing us and affecting us. And we just cannot do anything to overcome that unless and until we're willing to take the steps necessary to root out these problems, to be more proactive in the maintenance and safeguarding of our fundamental and inalienable God-given rights. Now, of course, the graduates of Pavlov School of Journalism for the salivating mainstream media don't want to discuss it in this context or in this framework because deep down they loathe and despise that. They realize that it would go against their own dark and twisted machinations and their propagandistic Fabian socialist agenda. But that is not in our best interest. It never has been, it never will be, and it falls upon us in our capacity as the true ultimate wielders of popular sovereignty to root out these problems, to overcome these problems, to strengthen our nation, and to move forward away from all of this detrimental malarkey that has been foisted upon us so that we can again begin to place this nation back onto the path to prosperity. That's why my first officer, Jeremy Grapenton, and I have so oft times reiterated on previous episodes of Radio Aviation Excellence, The Right Flyer, that you have to foster that fluent and working knowledge and understanding of our shared United States Constitution and thereby your fundamental and inalienable God-given rights, because then you are empowered to see through all of the fog of deception that is being belched out by the frothing at the mouth Fabian socialist leftists, these alt-right 
nutbags, all of these nefarious elements, and you go back to basics. Because when you go back to basics and you have that fluent and working knowledge and understanding of the Constitution, you can fall back to it and say, wait a minute, no, the Constitution says this, what they're saying isn't in line with that, and therefore what they're pushing is diametrically opposed to, in direct contradiction of, the clear and concise language contained within the four corners of the supreme law of the land, our Constitution. And remember, folks, the Constitution doesn't belong to Trump. It's not for sale. It doesn't belong to Barack Hussein Obama. It doesn't belong to Hillary Rotten Clinton or the government or these nameless, faceless, and ultimately unaccountable bureaucrats. It belongs to we the people. This entire government belongs to we the people. And it is high time that we get it back to serving us. Instead of it dictating, how we live, dictating what we can do, stripping us of our individual dignity, of our ability to think and to act and to deliberate and to, to, to live our lives and make our decisions for ourselves. We don't want to be taken care of from cradle until grave because that means we lose our ability to think for ourselves. And again, it goes back to that dark and twisted game of semantics that's played by the frothing at the mouth Fabian socialist leftists and also by Donaldoff Julius Caesar Trampolini and his brigade of the alt right in saying that it's either equal oppor or you know equal outcomes with the Fabians or egalitarianism is wrong and weak anyway. You just can't make that stuff up, but that's what they do. That's what they believe. And that is the message that they preach at the core of their twisted ideology. But I don't want to accept that ideology. That ideology is not reflective of all the things that we hold near and dear in this once thriving and flourishing representative republic and vibrant community of popular sovereigns of ours. Again, it requires that we get back to basics. And the basics have always been that we, the people, are the true ultimate wielders of popular sovereignty. That means that we have to be responsible for our actions, that we hold ourselves and our fellow popular sovereigns accountable for their words, deeds, and actions. And it means that we hold leadership accountable for it too. Because when you look at the First Amendment, you see that it says that the right of the people to petition their government for a redress of grievances is so important that it's part of the First Amendment. That speaks volumes as to what the government is supposed to do, what its original design and intentions were. But it also speaks to just how far from it we have pushed ourselves. By adopting this mentality of the erroneous doctrine of voting for the lesser of two evils, this detente, live and let live mindset, we have allowed the center of this nation to slide ever further to the left. And as Steve D said in that multi-piece series that he's putting out in Conservative Review about why conservatism has lost this election, it's because, again, the twisted game of semantics comes up when we say that this is a center-right nation. It's that the center has moved so far to the left that the so-called right is not even recognizable. Pursuant to the clear and concise language contained within the four corners of our shared United States Constitution. And that is a problem that the graduates of Pavlov School of Journalism for the salivating mainstream media and the betrayal wing of conservative media, people like Laura Inkumpf and Michael Weena Savage and Sean Wannity and Lush Bimbo have ignored. They've caused us to disconnect from that. They've caused us to forget the roots of who we are and what it is that has truly made us a fantastic nation. And instead, they go out and apologize for a man who is pushing a form of populism that is directly contradictory to 
the Constitution. Or, in the case of Edmund Kozak, that cuck sucker over there at LifeZet, to say that the Constitution is just a piece of paper. Hey, cuck sucker, why don't you go back to Edinburgh, Scotland, and stick your head in the sand over there and leave this country? And as for those frothing at the mouth Fabian socialist leftists like Colin Kaepernick, who sits there, I won't stand for the national anthem because this nation is inherently a racist and oppresses black people and people of color. Go to hell. Leave. If you think it's so bad, give up your wealth and get the hell out. Because we're sick and tired of this nonsense. We're sick and tired of the balkanization. We're sick and tired of all of this malarkey of identity politics. These threadbare tactics and strategies of divide and conquer. We're tired of it. There is only one identity that matters in these United States of America, and that is the one that is defined within the Constitution as citizens of the United States. Equal protection under the law, due process, our fundamental and inalienable rights as codified in the Bill of Rights or the first ten amendments to our shared United States Constitution make it clear that none of that crap that is being foisted upon us by the frothing at the mouth Fabian socialist leftists is true. And then if they're going to try and say white privilege, this, that, and the other, that too is a load of equine excrement as well as bovine excrement. Look, they're insulting our intelligence. It's what they've always done. It's what they've always aspired to do. It's what they think will make this nation whatever they want it to be. And clearly, as we have so oft times stated on previous episodes of Radio Aviation Excellence, The Right Flyer, what they want is not congruous with, not in conjunction with, not aligning with what we are supposed to be based on those natural law tenets that form the bedrock foundation of our shared United States Constitution and our Federalist, constitutionally endowed, representative Republican form of government. You see, we must be cognizant and aware of all of these threats and all of these twisted machinations that are being utilized to inherently weaken and to vandalize, for lack of a better term, this once thriving and flourishing representative republic and vibrant community of popular sovereigns of ours. And the frothing of the mouth Fabian socialist leftists are just jumping up and down with joy that there has been this sort of chicanery and decay, particularly at the Coif News Network, but also with respect to Donaldoff, Julius Caesar, Trampolini. This is who they were wanting to run against, folks. Trump is the guy that Hillary always wanted to run against. She, she doesn't even have to go out there and say anything. And I'm sure you've noticed this little inherent pattern that crops up and repeats itself time and time again every time some negative bit of news or information comes out about Madame Clinton. Well, all of a sudden, there's, there's Donaldoff on his hairy steed to say some outlandish, ridiculous, bovine excrement that whips every outlet of the graduates of Pavlov School of Journalism for the salivating mainstream media into a feeding frenzy and distracts attention away from that of Hillary Clinton. And you see, he still goes out and attacks fellow Republicans, and he's always attacked fellow Republicans with far greater zeal and energy than he has ever gone after Hillary Clinton, and I haven't heard him once really go after any of the Democrat senators or the Democrat congressmen or governors or anything. So what? Is he low energy when it comes to that? He went after El Jefe Jebe Bush with that line th that stunk, saying that he was the low energy candidate. Well, when it comes to standing up for our values, not only is Donald J. Trump low energy, he's no energy. He has no desire to do it. And that was his intention from the beginning. 
And so, we find ourselves here. What do we do? Well, the most important thing that we can do is sure up down ticket. To sure up that there is a Congress and Senate to help fight Hillary Rotten Clinton. We may suffer and most likely will suffer major setbacks in this 2016 presidential election cycle uh, down ticket as well because of Donald Trump and because of the divisiveness and because of the alt-right attempting this hostile takeover. But we survived these two disastrous terms of the Barack Hussein Obama regime and we can survive Hillary Rotten Clinton. You see, we can't just buy into the fear-mongering notion anymore because the problems that we face now are greater than the Supreme Court. They're greater than the most god-awful candidates we've seen. The problems that we're facing go right to the heart of who we are, both as a nation and as a people, and our very sovereignty is hanging in the balance. And folks, that is something we can ill afford to allow to happen. That is something that we cannot just bow down and allow these nefarious forces to strip away from us. We cannot allow them to redefine who we are as a nation and as a people because then it really will be nigh impossible to place this nation back onto the path to prosperity. Again, it must come from the internal will and drive of we the people, the true ultimate wielders of popular sovereignty in this once thriving and flourishing representative republic of ours. Now I know that that is not an easy thing to hear and that it's far easier said than done, but we have no choice. We must either embrace this and do what we have to do or we can watch the decay, the degradation, the destruction, the, 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 the just awful torrent of crap continue unabated. Or we can do what we have to do. And I know, based on the strong, indomitable, and unconquerable spirit of the true ultimate wielders of popular sovereignty, we the people, that we will not bow down, that we will not give up. And that is why we here at Radio Aviation Excellence, the right flyer, are the new resistance. We are the voice of liberty. We will not turn our back on the foundational cornerstone of this great republic of ours. Because that cornerstone, that great social contract or compact that rests at the heart of who we are, both as a nation and as a people, is still a great thing. And it's something that we cannot, we will not, we must not, we shall not abandon. Because if we do, then are we no better than those who have sold out their souls Folks, this isn't about our own ego. This isn't about our own power or prowess. It's not about any of that. What it is about is our ability to maintain the vitality and viability of this once thriving and flourishing representative republic and vibrant community of popular sovereigns of ours. It is about standing up for all that we hold near and dear to ensure that the up-and-coming generations, and indeed those generations which have yet to be born, can freely exercise their fundamental and inalienable God-given rights with even greater ease than we ourselves were able to exercise them. That is what our founding fathers called upon us to do. That is what a free nation needs. That is what it means to be a virtuous republic. But again, the historical revisionists, the graduates of Pavlov School of Journalism for the salivating mainstream media, all of these nefarious forces would not have us understand that, would not have us believe that, would have us not stand up for that. They would have us abandon everything that is of value. And that is why they embrace the cancerous doctrines of political correctness and moral relativism. But we can overcome any and all of that because it's our duty our obligation, and above all, our responsibility as the sovereigns to do that. We must be the vanguard of liberty. Because if we're not, 
they win. But no external force and surely no internal force as long as we spread the knowledge of the Constitution will ever be able to defeat us because we won't go away. They can kill us individually. They can try and silence us, but they cannot destroy the ideal because the ideal is based in those natural law tenets that are by their very nature timeless. Now, with that said, it is time for us to begin our descent. I'm going to go ahead and send the flight attendant back with one last round of alcohol. Do be careful. We don't want any allegations of sexual harassment back there. As always, folks, I'm your captain, Randy Wright, and I want to thank you for tuning in to the Wright Flyer and joining us today. And I also invite you to leave any questions, comments, or concerns you may have either here at our YouTube page or our Facebook page. You can also visit our Google Plus page. And on top of that, I invite you to follow us at Twitter with the Twitter handle at Radio Aviation EX. One more time, folks, that's at Radio Aviation EX. And there you will find the departure board that lists my personal Twitter account, the personal Twitter account of my first officer, Jeremy Grapenton, our Blogspot account, which now also has audio-only versions, MP3 versions of our show here so you can download them and go with your phone or your mp3 player or whatever device you want to put it on and listen at your own leisure and then there is the cafe press account now with the cafe press account we have all sorts of trinkets and goodies from apparel and attire and just all sorts of nice things with our traditional logo on it and our first class passenger logo on it at reasonable prices, and with such a wide array of things, you can surely find something that suits your need and can allow you to display to the rest of the world that you are enlightened. Once again, folks, thank you for flying the right flyer. We'll see you next time. Do take care.